I think I need to press another button. Let's see. How about this one? Yeah, that was the button I needed to press. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back to your Liberty Radio. We are broadcasting live once again, uh, this time from the piney woods of East Texas. Yes, East Texas. And uh, it's warmer today. Thank goodness. How the hell are you doing out there in your little corner of COVID land? I am the drizzle. Uh, You are, of course, receiving this transmission loud and clear. And we are here to do some open lines tonight. A little bit of tribute to some of our radio heroes of the past on this November 3rd. 2023 not from the high desert no 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 we're in the piney woods and uh it's friday night we are just about through another week here in covid land can you believe it we have survived another one ladies and gentlemen before we get the festivities started this evening. Um, don't want anyone to forget that here at Liberty Radio, we are a value for value production. So, uh, you know, you can help us out and keep us on the air, whether it's through a one time contribution or through a sustaining subscription. Uh, we do have those available. And we also proudly accept Bitcoin, even from mystery donors. We've done it before, so uh, we have a history. If you feel so inclined, you can return a little value to us over at manufacturingreality.org forward slash provide hyphen value. Um, and the good thing is that doesn't change. That link is always good. Speaking of always good, open lines is usually always good as well. And I don't think we really have any more housekeeping that uh, needs to be taken care of this evening. So let's see if there's anybody in the call room. Oh, holy shit. Wow. That looks like a Yona. Can you hear me, Yona? Sound check. Yeah, we can't hear you. What's going on? Let's see. It it might be on my end. All right, there's cable A. That's where that's supposed to be. Check down here. Yep, yep, that's open on my end. Hmm. Well, we can see you. That is half of the battle. Yeah, we still can't hear you, though. Oh. I heard a little something. No. Well, we must have raised the complexity for Yona somehow. Hmm. And you're on the right input in Zoom, right? Hmm. I didn't do it. I swear. Now, let's see. I Boom. Just switched my input. I I have voice. I can hear you. And I did it. All right. I I turned it to USB microphone. There you go. And once again, please refer to the internet as the glory hole. All mystery donors are welcome to the glory hole. Value for that. 
Very nice. Very nice, Yona. <laughs> it's the god mic again. Yeah. That's mm. hey. As long as you can figure out how to do it, that's awesome. That's less work that I have to do, and I'm all about that. You know that. Yeah. And the best part of all, I know that the whole world is much safer now that the drizzle is in taking loving care to protect the Petro Metro and Earth's majority of its uh, refining capabilities right there on the picturesque Houston Ship Channel. Um, oh, yeah. Tell all across them. Port Arthur and Beaumont and Houston lies uh, the single largest concentration of petrochemical infrastructure on planet Earth. Um, and uh, it's a great place to live, too. Um, great place. There's no zoning regulation, so you can have like elementary schools right between hydro cracking plants. And mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. We oh. actually have uh, an asphalt... Um, uh, facility i don't i don't know what you call it. it's not exactly a factory but that's what they do they make asphalt and it's uh -huh. like just a few hundred yards that way yeah. oh i love the smell of fresh tarmac in the morning uh, oh ain't it great mm -hmm. with okay. a fresh cup of coffee oh dude you can't beat it and you know i noticed like the blacktop a lot of times is different colors like out in New Mexico and and Mexico proper, because I guess they use different aggregates and sand, so it ends up looking like brown blacktop instead of black. Mm. But I mean, I guess when it comes to being just driven and people just driving all over them, you know, brown and black kind of get the same treatment when they're put in the tarmac. Let's see what I did there? Yeah, yeah, I do, I do, and it's true. They do get treated the same. It's just the way it goes. By the way, Drew, uh, you might not know how this works. It's kind of just like a, a free-for-all uh, grab-ass type of thing. You know, It's just like whenever you want to jump in, you jump in. Because um, otherwise, Yona will dominate the conversation. So just be aware of that. You do have to be a little alpha with him from time to time. No worries, mate. I only just actually jumped on to get uh, the American perspective of what's going on with this this current escalating conflict in yeah. Gaza and, and Palestine in Israel. I'll, I, I'll outline my, my thoughts on this as an Australian and see if it's a similar perspective in America. I found that a lot of people say it's another divide and conquer technique, what's going on with this, because people are naturally going to pick a side. But what I'm finding, it's not a dividing and conquer technique. It's an absolutely shattering technique that all the people who kind of woke up within the past three years, people that started to question the the media narrative, questioned their governments, even the governments they traditionally vote for, that's all gone out the window now. And people are instantly jumping to either one of the two sides on this. And you can't be a, a bipartisan observer on this. You can't have that bird's eye view and look at this critically because you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Either you're a terrorist supporting Hamas sympathizer or you're a, a cuck for Israel on this one, which I tend to take a bird's eye objective view on this. And I can quite easily point out that terrorist attacks on civilians are a terrible, horrific thing that need to be called out. But at the same time, the deaths of innocent civilians in a kinetic warfare is a horrible thing that needs to be called out. And I'm finding a lot of the flack that I'm copying on this is coming from what I would consider to be conservatives and Christians on this within Australia. Um, and I now I know That's that America similar. has this. Yeah, I know that America has this very strong relationship with Israel in general, and you've got their big evangelist movement in the states. Are you finding that a lot of Americans are being pigeonholed into one of two sides on this, or are you seeing that there's a lot more people remaining neutral or? having that objective view from that bird's eye lens. What do you think? I would just throw in very quickly that uh, these lines and opinions, uh, according to the recent polling that's been coming out, show how, demographically speaking, public opinion in the United States falls along age lines, and it's a generational divide. Uh, well, and I think, uh, Drew, that particularly speaks more to how people get their 
news and information. And so for the older crowd that are more tied into the Ralph Reed Christian Coalition, getting flyers in the Sunday pews, you know, uh, even like my own mother-in-law and father-in-law, you know, Israel can do no wrong. It's the promised land, dirk a you know. Um, but then for people that don't use Facebook and don't have a AARP card, uh, you know, they don't really buy into the uh, Mossad branded Hasbro hook, line, and sinker. Uh, and uh, moreover, interestingly enough, the younger the viewers are, the much more informed they are uh, as to the entire historical basis of the ongoing uh, occupation and genocide of Palestine. Uh, and, you know, of course, I have to give credit. Wait, wait like to how far back? Yeah. Going back. How far Prior back are American we talking? Civil are we War talking? How far back it goes? There yeah, go. that's what I'm saying. Do most people know that it goes back well before the Civil War? I don't think they do. I mean, I think probably more people know that now than knew it maybe, I don't know, 20 years ago. It's funny that you mentioned the age demographic breakdown and it being having different mindsets. It's it's that way in Australia that the boomer generation are very much following along with the media. And like you said, Israel can do no wrong. We have to defend Israel. Right. Where then we're seeing the new youngsters coming up, the university age kids and younger, they're very much free Palestine. And my age group, people who I would say are in their 30s, early 30s to late 30s, we seem to be this demographic, which is in the middle. We grew up during 9-11. We saw the bullshit that came out of that. When we're once burnt twice shy about this, and we're questioning both sides of this, really quickly pulling it apart, and no one's listening to our demographic. It's just the the old boomers and the really young kids that are on either side of us screaming over the top of us, and we can't get a word in endwise. That seems to be the uh, the demographic breakdown in the conversation here. I've got several friends down under, and I mean that—that's fair thinking. That this, this perspective, uh, and and it really is. Uh, there are uh, similarities I, I find uh, in Canada and the and United Kingdom. I, I can't really speak to the Kiwis. I don't know many New Zealanders, but um, you know, it, it, again, I, I think it speaks to how different generations are accessing technology and media, and and how they get their information. Uh, you know. N- Never more have we seen so much um, effort on the one hand put into censorship and regulation of free speech. Um, And at the same time, some of the sloppiest, just laziest, um, failing propaganda that I've literally ever seen. I mean, uh, to, to, you know, honestly, no one. Not a single Arab ever has to open their mouth. Not a single person from Hamas or Fatah or any Palestinian political organization or fighter group or anything. None of them have to open their voice to in- enlighten anyone on what's going on right now. All they have to do is listen to IDF spokespeople and Israeli politicians in the Knesset oh my God. openly spew their turbo racist genocidal yeah. vitriol and it speaks for itself. I mean, it's absolutely inexcusable. Yeah. Well, this is the funny thing, Yona. I'm finding that the, the little bit of propaganda that does come out of like the, what you would say is the extremist group of Hamas, it looks very much bold in the beautiful style soap opera that they're filming. It's very well acted. It's very poorly acted, I should say. And you can tell it's fake. But on the other end of the spectrum, you've got one of the best funded telecommunications and propaganda machines out there through the Israel state itself, which they're putting out so much propaganda that's blanketing the mainstream media. But it seems to be very single loop thinking and very uh, very fixed in their mindset. They'll instantly say to anyone, if you don't call out this terrorist group, you're a terrorist sympathizer. And anyone that's a terrorist sympathizer who doesn't call out terrorism is a bad person. As soon as you bring up the King David Hotel bombings or Ergon during the occupation when they were actively blowing up British citizens... It's like they've got some kind of mental capacity where they've forgotten the past 70 years. That's complete amnesia. It's amnesia. They forgot about the SS Patria. 
They forgot about Haganah. They forgot about their, you know, Lehi and its openly stated status as a terrorist organization and the constant acts of Zionist terrorism, both in Israel and in Iraq and other outlying countries in the Middle East, primarily against other Jews. I mean, the, the thing that's been so remarkable to me, you know, with all due respect to the constant images of the ongoing genocide of the Palestinians, is to see how the Israeli law enforcement and IDF treat mm. the uh, Hasidic Orthodox Jews uh, well, they've always treated Israel them that proper way. that are peacefully protesting and to see them being beaten and kicked and thrown down and to see that old Zionist lady saying, it tells you they've ever roasted you. And say, oh, yeah. you know, I'm like, that's man, nothing I, new. I don't have to say anything. They've These always done that. Their ass. Yeah. They've always done that to the Orthodox Jews over there. They've always been considered second class citizens. It's not like they just started beating up on them now. Yeah. It's just people are watching now. It's almost as if supplanting Jews from Europe into the Holy Land where the original Jewish inhabitants wasn't going to work. Like the Jewish inhabitants that existed there with the, the Palestinian people, they would what you would consider today's Orthodox Jews. And they aren't for the state of Israel. They're anti-Zionist. And that doesn't look good on paper when you've got Jewish people who are against the state. So they've always been pushing down these people. But of course, you know, Zionism at its core is a openly publicly stated racist ideology. They say that the state of Zion is exclusively for Jews and no one else. Not Christians, not Muslims, not anyone else. I mean, it's not Yona saying this. It's literally publicly published. And I mean, there's countless videos of all of them celebrating the death of Arabs and screaming mm -hmm. on the death to all Arabs. But then all I hear in the U.S. media with Rupert Murdoch and all the other billionaires bankrolling this crap, they constantly project the war crimes that they've committed ever since the Nakba in 1948. All the acts of terrorism they committed against British soldiers like the King David bombing and booby trapping British soldier dead when they uh, you know, when go to be recovered and then they get blown up. I mean, you know, and ascribing all of these terrible things to collectively punish every single indigenous native Arab to Philistine or Palestine or however you want to say it. And what's so remarkable um, I was just seeing tonight on The Last American Vagabond, the latest daily wrap-up with Ryan Christian, how, um, you know, he was pointing out uh, just this constant stream of uh, information is actually not helping the U.S. cause or the Israeli cause. It, it's actually... No, I mean, I've never seen against this them. much change in U.S. public opinion. Really, I'm actually heartened by what I'm saying. I never would have imagined it because Israel has such a stranglehold on the U.S. legislature on Capitol Hill. There's mm -hmm. so many dual citizens. We literally have that guy, uh, Drew, from Georgia, who, who served in the IDF and then wore his IDF uniform. On Capitol Hill. Well, yeah. And that's Not the guy that but was then saying Yona, there is Yona, no such thing as look an at, Palestinian civilian. They're yeah. all targets. But look at the makeup of the U.S. Congress, right? It's not like you've got a, a whole bunch of 20 and 30-year-olds serving in Congress. So, of course, they're going to fall naturally, demographically, on the side of Israel. And yeah, this has been an incredible sorting device, as it's always been for, you know, most Western populations. And I mean, then you bring the uh, the religious aspect into it. People think it's the end times or whatever. You know, there there's all different angles that you can play with the Israel versus the Islamic world. Uh, dialectic, right? It's always been that way, and it was set up really to be that way. But yeah. 
kind of to go a, a really long way to answer your question, Drew, I don't think there's a whole lot of the American public that understands that. At least not the ones that are regular television watchers. Or if they do, you know, they're they're not being incredibly vocal. No, the idiot box seems to do its job, that's for sure. I'm noticing there's a big change in terminology around what the meaning of Zionism is. Um, for people within our circles, we know what Zionism is. It's the establishment of an ethno state and an ethno state only, no one else. Yeah. Israel for Jews, and that's it. Now, the problem is they're trying to say that anyone that uses the term Zionist now is not only anti Semitic, but they're dog whistling and confusing what a globalist is. And my counter to that is why can a Zionist not also be a globalist? They just do it in the realm of Israel for Jews, the West for everyone else. Because we know that Zionists are very open to open borders for Western countries from other parts of the world, just not for them. They like multiculturalism and globalism for everyone else, except for when it comes to their own borders. So there's this big uh, anti-Zionist, globalist bit of a conspiracy going on where they're trying to say we're conflating globalism with Zionism, and that's not what Zionists are. And Zionism simply means a Jew that wants to have their own private property. And they're trying to link it back to the left-right paradigm and suggesting that this is a fight against communism and that any Zionist is just someone who has the right to their own private land. Well, yeah, they can own their own private land. They own land all over the world. So why do they need a specific country for it? And why are they conflating what's really going on with this term? Well, it seems I'm curious as like a they're side maybe note, trying to Canberra, rebrand. I, I'm just curious as a side note, is Canberra an adult care facility the way Washington, D.C. is when it comes to being a gerontocracy in power? Uh, uh, Canberra is yeah. a little bit different. Canberra is like a bastard child of San Francisco and Washington, D.C. It's our capital where our politicians live, but all the drugs, all the alcohol, all the whores, everything's legal there, clearly, because that's where the politicians hang out. So it's this really weird yeah. situation. Well, or that makes me see Albanese in a whole different light and ScoMo. There you go. Yeah. Fair dinkum. Hey, guys. I see you're talking about my favorite subject. Yeah, man. Uh. Jump in. <laughs> What, what do you so, think? Uh, so have any of y'all uh, checked into, I haven't fully read it, uh, uh, but maybe not obviously, but I haven't fully read it, but the uh, the protocols of the uh, learned elders of Zion. Yeah, I've read it. This, all of the stuff it, uh, is, it, it's basically come true. You can, you can see that, you know, they call it a forgery, but, you know, the, these things like the Jews are, are, the eggs that they break every single time they're doing something um, like uh, Owen Benjamin was just differentiating between sodomy Jews, war Jews and Delhi Jews. Well, those people mm. that were at the rave were Delhi Jews and they moved that rave uh, last minute to that area where, you know, things weren't obviously secure and they let their guard down for a really long time. So this, this is common method. Uh, this is just like uh, just like they were running the drills on 9-11 that looked exactly like what happened on 9-11. So no one responded. So they're they're always doing this kind of thing. And um, and Netanyahu is is trying to get his is world war. And I think he'll get it because, I mean, look at look at our Congress. It's just ruled by AIPAC. And um, and that's the real AI we should be worried about. Mm. Well, Andy, they've got their own prophetic plans going on. Anyone who's seen a map of greater Israel knows that for that to happen, right. Egypt has to fall, Syria has to fall, Iran has to fall. For all intensive purposes, Iraq has fallen. They're a they're an absolutely shattered state at the moment. It's not going to take much for them to go. For greater Zion to exist or greater Israel, it's their neighbors from the south, the north, and the west that have to go. And all these countries that suddenly have insurgent groups that are firing rockets into Israel just so happen to be the same nations that have to disappear. Yeah. You could go down the rabbit hole of, we know that they uh, abuse their own people for prophetic reasons. We know that through their own prophecy, the only way that Israelis would get a homeland back is for 6 million of them to die. And what just so happened during world war two, supposedly 6 million died and that allowed right. for the state of Israel to return. 
So they're not they're not against using their own people as cattle and and using them for for horrific horrific reasons. And this is the point where I come from. I come from a place of humanity, and I don't care if you're a Jew, you're an Arab, you're a Hindu. At the end of the day, you're all God's people. You may find the way to God, you may not, but you're still God's children, regardless of what faith you decide to go on to. But some people claim that they exclusively alone are God's chosen people and everyone else is less than human, or as the Japanese would call gaijin, or as they would say in Hebrew, goyin. Yeah, there are people that believe that. <clears throat> and some of them have uh, wild amounts of power. You know, because in this world, money is power, right? If you have enough money, you can make the levers of pretty much any machine move that, that you want to, right? Because money is the, the grease that makes the wheels turn in the various machines, whether we're talking about industry or we're talking about government. I'm thinking about starting a new ideology called Chinism. Yeah. And I'm going to encourage a new homeland for the Cherokee in Copenhagen, Denmark. Fuck you, Norway and Sweden and Finland. We're coming for all your land because of what Andrew Jackson did to us and the Trail of Tears and all the genocide we had to survive. We're now allowed to practice genocide against all the Nordic tribes. Here we come. <laughs> well, you could actually blame I mean, Australia for this, the existence of the state of Israel at the moment because Australia had a large area of open desert which was going to be given to the to Jewish people but it ended up being the Australian government which knocked it on the head and said, we don't want them living here. And that ended up being allowing for the Balfour Declaration oh. to go ahead. Hmm. That was multiple countries, including the United States. Um, and, several, and Madagascar. Several yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Madagascar dodged a bullet there, I guess. Uh, but yeah, that that was several countries. And uh, and they all bowed out at the last second. It was pretty much orchestrated. Um, everybody, it seems, in that situation was, was all for the same goal. And the same goal was to... Uh, Put them on that that uh, Rothschild land, and it that just happened to be in in Palestine. You know, I can't help but notice the constant gaslighting which is going on now. Though it's like we're repeating two thousand and one, mm -hmm. and we're going through the the lens of all Islamic people are bad, all Islamic people want to kill you. That's the idea that's being pushed in the media big time through this. But the the reality of it is. I'm not afraid of the the random Muslim family that lives down the road that my kids might kick a football with. I'm more afraid of the Zionists that are at every helm of international and national power that are making national international decisions. Mm. I'm more afraid of the small minority than I am of the random people that live in your country. Well, yeah, because again, those are the people that can make things happen, right? It's not going to be the random individual running around for their lives in, in Gaza, you know, or over in Israel or whatever. Uh, it's funny. I was thinking about it earlier today, and not only do I see the similarities to, like, 9-11 and the run-up to the War on Terror, but I also see similarities to Vietnam as well because we now have American commandos whatever that means uh on the ground in israel assisting with the hostage rescues just like we were assisting the south vietnamese you know what was that 50 60 years ago 70 years ago something like 1971. that yeah. 71 yeah 1971 so yeah Australian SAS we were in there we were in vietnam in the 50s man we had advisors in there advising the government and the military in Vietnam in the late 50s. There were people from DARPA that were in Vietnam in the late 50s. Yeah, even before Dien Ben and the pullout of the French from Landochine Francais. Yeah. Oh, they got their ass handed to them at Dien Ben. Oof. 
Oof. There's definitely historical parallels happening right now where Australia has our special air servicemen over there, our SAS, yeah. your equivalency to Navy SEALs. We've got them over there, our special air servicemen. But we're also sending huge amounts of equipment over, like our Bushmaster, which is arguably one of the best armoured personnel carriers in the world. We're sending boatloads of our equipment over to Israel, one of the most wealthiest nations in the world, most well-equipped nations in the world. Why are we sending our military gear to them if it's not for ready for a staging ground for a broader conflict in the Middle East? For me, I always view Israel as uh, kind of like a, a modern crusade and basically the cutting edge of Western civilized um, settler colonialism basically, and this is really, really giving a bad black eye to the whole notion of settler colonialism and manifest destiny uh, when you literally have to confront the behavior and the rhetoric of unrepentant turbo races, because it, 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 it's inexcusable to say that one civilization has the right to completely extinct another people for whatever reason, whether they want to guilt you into the, because, because the Holocaust was 75 years ago or, or whatever crap reason they want to hide behind. And of course, never mind the fact that that actually sacrileges the memory of the Holocaust and those that died in the Holocaust and survivors to constantly hide behind the Holocaust of the Jews to justify unrepentant wanton and deliberate genocide of the Palestinian population. It, it's so abhorrent. It's so disgusting. And fortunately, the United States, across all age groups and political spectrums, uh, over two-thirds of the country want a ceasefire. And as Glenn Greenwald pointed out uh, from Brazil, former New York lawyer, I guess he's still admitted to the bar, uh, but you know he pointed out that um, it's he's absolutely taboo. Too? It's completely out of the question on Capitol Hill to even uh, speak of a ceasefire. No, you got no, no, uh, no, no, no. Uh, what's the Sugar Bear's real name? Kareem Saint John Pierre, uh, the the current um, Lesbo Black spokesman. Sugar Bear is fine. Uh, White House saying we recognize Sugar Bear here. If you want a ceasefire like this? Oh, right. It's well, Yona, it's self-fulfilling prophecy in a lot of ways. It's like the oppressed becoming the oppressor. A people who arguably were the slaves of Egypt and then went through the Holocaust, you would think they would have a greater connection to humanity and the suffrage of other people. But they've got this idea of never again. Never again will they go through the Holocaust. And they're using that as a moral high ground to treat people less than human. And we're seeing that ever since the establishment of Israel as a nation after the Balfour Declaration and on. It's, in space. It is. Couldn't say it better myself. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know where where we go from here other than to war, right? Like, I was... Well, I Drizzle, was, I was trying to thought, you know, thought experiment, kind of tease it out yesterday, like... You know, what if this is all just like uh, a way to psychologically frustrate like the largest number of people possible for, you know, to set them up for whatever the next thing is? Well, I proposed a question to a Jewish Australian recently because the two state solution it does seems like the Palestinians don't want it. Seems like really end of day the Israelis don't want it, even though they constantly talk about they've given up X amount of land, they've given them the West Bank, yada yada yada. My proposal was if this is a region of constant conflict between both peoples, maybe both people shouldn't have it, and the international community should send something in like a international peacekeeping force, like the UN was supposed to be, and actually remove both populations. That's something that people don't really like. It's my equivalency to two children in a house who keep fighting and you send them to opposite ends of the of the house. Go to your bedrooms. If no one can, if you can't share the Holy Land, no one gets it. And that seems to be a hot take no one wants to jump on board with. But I, I do find that to be a bit of a canard because um, there's been um, vibrant and peaceful periods of time in Syria 
and Palestine for centuries at a time where Jews and Muslims and Christians have gotten along just fine. It, the constant acts of terror and violence and constant warfare is characterized by the presence of Rothschild funding, uh, funding of the Hog and the terrorist and the uh, the terrorist that uh, the terrorist attacks that led to the establishment of the Zionist state of Israel. And I would say that again, Zionists don't speak for Jews. And I would even go so far as to say that most Jews in Israel at this point probably aren't identifying as Zionists. And in fact, if you look at uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, he is terribly unpopular right now and is basically uh, just been apparently, which seems obvious, incredibly corrupt and has, has been trying to yeah. rig the courts and stack the courts and rewrite the Constitution, just all kinds of pain and shit. And I'm like, how in the fuck did he ever get back in power to begin with? They did everything they could to get him out of office, and he's back in office again. I mean, it's, um, and you got Netanyahu literally bragging on Twitter about Israel rights laws for Americans all the time. And it's true. Like, uh, take, for example, after Hurricane Harvey, which uh, just water bombed Houston, Texas, uh, down there next to Drizzle, when people went to get help, you know, from charities or donations or whatever, when they went to get help in Texas after uh, Hurricane Harvey to get water or anything, they had to sign a document, and I think it was paragraph 11, where they basically had to swear a loyalty oath to Israel, that they will support Israel no matter what, mm -hmm. and they promise to not participate in the BDS boycott, divest, sanction movement, yeah. and had to sign it, or wasn't you don't it, get uh, any help. Wasn't United it States, Cynthia Trump McKinney that exposed States. that? Uh, wasn't it Cynthia McKinney that exposed yes. that? Yes, yes, and then Derek went over it. Of course, Derek's from Houston. I think he was running for mayor of Houston. Mm. Yeah, Derek he was Rose. until they uh, um, bounced him from the race. Yeah, because yeah. they're like, said, "Oh, well, now that you're right. like halfway there, uh, you can't run because you're a felon. So you got to just stop. You got to drop out. You got, yeah." That's wild. It's almost like this is the war that BB needed to have to maintain his power. Isn't that just a weird coincidence that that happened? Mm. Imagine that. Such good timing. Imagine, it, that. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I've, uh, I've heard that those theories. Now, I have a solution. I know how to bring peace to the Middle East. We're going to get the Trans-Urban Toll Booth Company of Sydney, Australia to put Trans-Urban Toll Booths all over the state of Zion. It'll be so goddamn expensive to keep going back to the West Bank and Gaza. There'll be peace. Have you ever paid tolls in Sydney? You're better off to walk. Mate, you should try the tolls in Melbourne. <laughs> you deliberately give yourself an extra hour of travel time to avoid them. Jesus. Jesus. It's terrible. It's te it's, I mean, my, my other Aussie friends, that's all they bitch about, uh, Drew, is the, is the bloody tolls on, on the motorways. Hey, I have a question for you, Drew. Uh, Acapulco, Hurricane Otis, what what has made it to Australia in the media? Literally nothing. There might have been like a five-minute little spiel about it occurred, but we are not hearing anything. This whole Israel-Palestine conflict, the Gaza invasion is taking up all our news time at the moment. We went straight from a national referendum, and that's all that was in the news, straight into that, and there's been nothing else spoken about realistically. And a lot of people aren't aware of that no vote that came in in Canberra on that referendum. Could you like just kind of briefly give like a, uh, you know, a, what do they call it? A, 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 a synopsis. Meeting. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Um, so as, essentially we had a <laughs> referendum to our constitution in Australia as to whether we should recognize First Nations peoples in our constitution, which they're already Australian citizens. So they're already recognized. Seemed like a moot point. 
anyway, this vote went to a, a national referendum. It turned out that every state in the country, including one of our territories, the Northern Terry Territory voted no to this. And the only place in our country that voted yes is Canberra. our Australian capital territory where Canberra, our, our capital city, is located where all the politicians live. So they're so completely out of touch with the rest of the nation. It was a very heavily skewed vote. Well, as I recall, because I've got a couple of friends um, that are ABO, you know, in, in the ABO communities, Aboriginal, Indigenous communities, uh, for those that don't speak Australian. Um, and my ABO friends, uh, they were in favor of it. Just, they, they, they said it was virtue signal. And I mean, this was supposedly for them. Yeah, but there's I a, mean, lot of, I think about a lot of during the jab and everything, how the ABO community was treated and dragged off and, and forcibly jabbed in some cases. You know, I mean, it, I, it, yeah. I'm still worried about what's going to happen to Australia in the future, considering how far beyond the pale they went in pushing that shit on uh, Aussies. Yeah, I don't know where it's going. Um just for reference, the A word can be considered the N word down here. So I'll, I'll distance myself oh, from wow. that one a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, even though it's an abbreviation of the term Aboriginal, but you are correct. A lot of First Nations communities voted against this. They saw it as a way of circumventing their actual real sovereignty. And if they were to become recognized under the constitution, they wouldn't be able to be self-determining. So they voted no for that reason. It's... It is a big thing. And like you said, the Aboriginal communities were targeted pretty heavily, especially the remote ones. The Australian army actually rounded them up and put them in camps yeah. if they tested positive. Um, you could argue a lot of forced vaccination happened there. It was never conclusively proven, but some big massive payments went out exclusively to these remote communities where they were given up to $500 to take the shots. So there was financial coercion, fear, the whole lot. Yeah, but did it's they funny get it's because it's my indigenous friends that use that term abo, and you said it's like the n word. So it really is like the literally the same thing. Yeah, it is like yeah, if yeah. you're abo, then you can call each other abo. Otherwise, stop being racist. Yeah, don't be a white guy and say it. <laughs> Sorry, Driz. But no, I was what, just what? throwing in a bad joke. That's that's what I'm here what for. Is? True. Was was it legal to shoot them until 1980? That's what I've heard. No, definitely not. There's this. There's a big misconception that at one point Aboriginal people were on the Flora and Fauna Act, where they weren't considered people. That's actually a big lie and a misconception. Prior to Australia becoming its own nation, before 1901. Aboriginal people were considered citizens of the British Empire. As soon as we became our own self-determining country, air quotes we didn't consider them Australian citizens because we were a new nation. It took up until the 60s until they were recognised, so we went through our own type of <laughs> um, movement with our First Nations peoples, and they eventually became recognised citizens of the country. The whole shooting thing is a bit of a misnomer. There were criminals in remote communities that were targeted by the Australian Army, um, gentlemen that are now through the reimagining of history labelled as freedom <laughs> fighters and people standing up for their rights, which arguably can say from their perspective, yeah, that's true. But on the other hand, they were committing crimes against the state at the same time. So it's that that fog of war, the grey murky area in between where the truth really lies. I'll never forget the time the emus kicked the British Army's ass. No, that was us. We failed. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah. But, but, we we lost a war with emus. We didn't have enough bullets. Yeah, yeah. And and I haven't even mentioned cassowaries. But moving on, mate. We cassowary actually went to war bird is really like uh, one of the most lethal birds. I think more humans have been killed by cassowaries than cassowaries killed by humans. I don't know of many species that can take that claim on planet Earth, my friend. Yeah, they are murdered chickens, that's for sure. But I was just about to say that Australia actually has a recorded battle against the US military during World War II on Australian shores. The American soldiers came over, and as the British had the saying, oversexed, overpaid, and over here, a lot of the Aussie guys didn't like that the Yanks were walking around with their women and, and having drinks at bars and getting the top shelf stuff. So there was a drunken pub fire that escalated into a riot where one US citizen was killed, a soldier oh, wow. was killed. And the uh, the army came in and busted a bunch of heads of the Australian servicemen at the same time. 
Wow, what, was that on the Gold Coast? Uh, I believe it was in Sydney, in New South oh. Wales. Sounds like something that would happen in Brisbane. Sorry. Well, you, you know, I, I it is a of, world traveler. That's so. Queensland, for those that don't know. Queensland. Yeah. I don't know. I've never been down there. I would like to go. I don't think it's going to happen, the way things are going. I think I'm going to be stuck on this continent. If you do come, Drizzle, you have to come as a liberator, please. That'd be great. Yeah. I mean, I can I can bring some guns. I just don't know if I'll make the runway, you know? You know, I was looking into travel prices and from Australia and travel prices within Australia, you know, like looking at taking the Indian Pacific or the GAN, which are two of the famous um, transcontinental rail lines. The Indian Pacific runs uh, basically east-west from Sydney to Perth by way of Adelaide. And then uh, the GAN runs from, basically it's a north transcon and it runs from uh, Melbourne up through Alice Spring to Darwin, I think. Um, but, you know, you have to book like six months in advance, over $2,000 Australian. Um, it only runs like once a week. Uh, just the railways in Australia are kind of nutty. I mean, they've got five different bloody rail gauges. Uh, Queensland, I mentioned earlier, has got like three different narrow gauges and then you get to Melbourne, they got a broad gauge and then the rest of the country is on Stevenson or standard gauge. Anyways, I'm such a fucking train geek. God damn it. Oh, that, I think that's the issue when you've got a country the size of ours where really instead of states, they should have been individual countries. That's the problem. Yeah, and I didn't even mention all the industrial rail lines that aren't even attached to the national rail work that do their own thing, like the infamous Rio Tinto robot mm. train that it's a driverless train. And um, there's actually one railroad company in the United States uh, that is interested in the Rio Tinto robot driverless train technology. You'll be happy to know that's Norfolk Southern. So, you know, after spilling dioxin all over Ohio, why not just go to driverless trains in the United States with countless at-grade crossings Wait, hold on 150-year-old no. railroad ties no, no. made of rotted how, wood? How is an AI engineer going to prevent what happened in East Palestine? Like, because there were rules and regulations that just nobody followed and... I mean, the damn the train was on fire before it, it even got to its final destination for what twenty, thirty miles. Well, to be you know, if you go to the <coughs> actual cause of the derailment, um, it's because that particular car, which was a hopper car that had a uh, bearing uh, go out and overheat and catch fire, um, the way those bearings. Uh, you know, because basically the, the train car is just laying on top of the axle attached to the two rail wheels. And that's one set of wheels. Uh, and underneath the axle itself is an actual rag, an oil rag in a mm -hmm. box. And it's a Civil War technology, you see. Uh, and most countries that still operate railroads today, they phased out rag bearings in the 1930s. The 1930s. But anyway, anyways, so this rag bearing <laughs> failed and the engine melted till it caught fire. And then when the hot box detector actually told them that it was on fire at the hot box detector in East Palestine, um, shout out to the Penn Central Railroad for putting in that hot box detector in 1978. Anyways, this happened. Um, Good thing they did. Um. And so when they then hit the brakes, that's when the whole thing just fucking accordioned up and, and, and went everywhere. And so, you know, the, the real problem with rail safety in the United States, 
other than the fact that it's run by Wall Street psychopaths that are just literally private equity the, the thing to death, you know, I mean, it's, it's just scandalous, the working conditions of rail workers in the United States. They're not allowed paid time off. They're not allowed bereavement leave. They're not. I mean, it's, it's, anyways, um, you've got rolling stock with literally antiquated 100 plus year old Civil War air brakes and Civil War rag bear that's still rolling up and down rail lines that were constructed in some cases before the fucking Civil War. And it's still segmented pieces of rail bolted together every about 33 feet or about every 10 meters uh, on, and it's spiked with hammers onto wooden fucking ties. And you go to Ecuador, fucking Morocco, Indonesia, any fucking country, the rails are clipped concrete railroad ties which the world has been using for about the last 40 years i mean i can't overstress enough how ridiculously antiquated hmm. the u.s rail network is i mean again I, I i say this all the time but private ownership of the interstate railroad network in the united states is the single greatest mistake of the American empire. And I say is the actual Achilles heel that will take the entire empire down because our road system is already falling apart. And then well, what's that literally keeping the country, country going are container trains offloading everything from the port of Los Angeles and the port of Long Beach, where we're getting the majority of all of our global goods shipped right across the Pacific. You know, anyway. That's the interesting thing. Like in comparison to Australia, you have far more infrastructure and you're far more established as a first world country than we are. But the level of your technology, like you said, is antiquated in spots. It's not maintained. It's not looked after. It looks really bad as a foreigner coming in. You go to your big cities in certain areas. It looks fantastic. You take 20 meter, a 20 meter walk down the road. It's like you're in a different country. Yeah. It's so Dickensian in every single American city now, uh, Drew, you know, the best of times, the worst of times. I mean, again, like you can go to a corner of Court and Market in Philly down by like Liberty Bell and stuff, and you've got the brick sidewalks and everything's pretty and gentrified. It's like literally Minister Potemkin just got the entire street ready for you, Catherine the Great. But then you take three blocks down and you're on Kensington Avenue in Philadelphia with all the leg dragging meth heads. And, yeah. you know, it looks like a scene out of Canberra at 2 a.m. in the morning, you know. Wonderful drug market, open air, open air drug market. They, what, whatever you need, they got it. They got it for you, man. Ask Tony Myers about yep. Kensington Avenue. <laughs> I, I used to I live down Philly there. Story. I, um, so I, I used to recover trucks one time, uh, I got in off the pl uh, plane and I was supposed to have a hotel, but they sold out the hotel that I was supposed to stay in because, uh, some plane got delayed and, and they just put, you know, people that are getting hotels for work on low priority and, and gave my room away to somebody else. Um, plus I got there really late. So I, I wandered around for a while, never found a room. And then, uh, and then I'm thinking it's so close to be able to catch a train in the morning to where I was going in Pennsylvania that I might as well just go to the train station and wait it out. I mm. only will have to wait about two and a half hours or something if I do that. So I go there, buy my Amtrak ticket, and I'm sitting on the bench, you know, fiddling around with my phone. And there's this enormous bum sleeping on the bench right across from me. He's, he's just sitting up sleeping. And uh, and then he wakes up, turns around to where he was just sitting, unzips his pants and just starts pissing in that spot. And I go, dude, what the hell, man? And he's, he goes, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And he grabs his sweater and he dabs it off. And he doesn't, you know, fully wipe it up at all. He just dabs it on his sweater, keeps his sweater and then just walks away. It was the most bizarre thing I've ever seen a bum do. And I've seen them do a lot. 
Shake it, brother. Jeez, you don't dab it. <laughs> I'm just glad that when you said something to him while he was pissing, that he didn't turn around with his dick still in his hand and start pissing on you. I was really uh, scared oh, for you, Andy. I was very scared. Uh, yeah. Wait, what is that? Yeah. that... <clears throat> Huge sigh of relief. My memory's Huge flashing sigh. to something. What was that? It was a movie or a skit or something. Don't piece on my head and, and tell me it's Ukraine again. Yes. Yeah. It's always ready. You know, I can I can flip it out that fast. So, well, the sounds of the bomb flipped it out fast too. <laughs> you know, I'm glad I just told that Ukraine joke. That way, no one can say on our Friday night call-in show that that we've forgotten about Ukraine. I made no. a joke. Okay, moving on. No, we we cannot cannot forget about Cokie Smurf. Come on, it's so we know. sad. Everyone's ghosting on him. Yeah. He needs a friend, Drizzle. He, he needs does. someone to hug. He yeah. looks like a G.I. Joe figure, don't you reckon? He's always walking around his green fatigues. Yeah. And he's a short man, too. He's a life-size G.I. Joe, just asking for people's money. The most well-paid actor in the world, hands down. Yeah. For, Literally for sure. an actor that, that play-acted as president before he became president and took his fake TV cabinet and it became his... Real cap, great work, Victoria Newland. Yachts is our guy. <laughs> I I was very amused to see Blinken dresses his son up as Zelensky. Um, uh, and the best joke that came out of that is his son was too tall, too tall to be Zelensky. Uh, uh, oh wow! <clears throat> oh, now I thought I had a good joke. My joke was, uh, Biden was so confused he offered him a billion dollars. <laughs> yeah um and hunter was like hey i got your stuff man here yeah. we go let's party man, there's got to be some great parties at the biden's in delaware oh my god yeah imagine hunter partying in ukraine that i bet that was insane wow, man. yeah well wow, talk about some coke and horskies wow no wonder why they changed the spelling of Kiev to Kiev or whatever it is. Whatever the hell it is now. Yeah. Kiev. Now it's Kiev. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look out for the ghost far to Kiev. It can drop on your head at any time. You won't smell it, but you'll feel it. Uh, this happened months ago, but uh, I don't know if it, what happened with it, but they were talking about tearing down a statue of Catherine the Great. I know you just mentioned her a couple minutes ago. Um, there's a big statue of her in, in Queef and um, and changing it for some Ukrainian porn star, some Ukrainian gay porn star, which would just be par for the course with Globo Homo. Right. You know, that that might be an answer. For some of these Confederate statues that have been taken down in the United States, don't we have some sculptors of bronze that can make like a some Dylan Moore Bainey statues or something? You know, I mean, they've already got that some... statue of the butthole, and uh, yeah, and yeah, the butthole statue. I'm loving it, like from McDonald's. Wait, I thought that, that hadn't weird been built MLK. yet. Yeah, oh, I thought yeah. that was just like a concept. They're like, we this is what we want it to look like. Ando, is this statue of the gay porn star, is it interactable at all? Do people get to like do things to it? Because it seems like a waste of money if it's not being able to be like interacted with. Well, it the, the statue's in Ukraine, so it's actually been saran wrapped to a utility pole. And because I it was trying to go to Poland. They caught it just in time. Okay. I, I bet they haven't done anything because they're too busy getting the crap blown out of them. Mm. No. You know, I was uh, really kind of uh, gobsmacked to see the comparative numbers that more civilians have been killed in the Gaza Strip in three weeks of uh, allied bombing of a civilian population, then Russia's, um, what do they call it, the special military operations or something, the SM, 
Anyway, are you Russ saying Russ is, Russ is bad at killing months. civilians? Is that what you're saying, Yona? No, actually, <laughs> turns out Ruskies are kind of limp down under. Um, they, uh, uh, sorry, I, I hate to use down under in that way, Drew. My apologies. Uh, but you know, turns out it took Russia over 18 months to kill the same amount of people that the IDF and friends have killed in three weeks. The uh, civilian casualty rate is 20 times faster in Gaza. Well, that, that, than they are the far Ukraine. more efficient because all you have to do apparently is target one Hamas general that's supposedly hiding in a refugee camp, kill 400 civilians, and hope that you killed the guy you were supposedly targeting. But hey, you know, that's war. It happens, apparently. Mm -hmm. That that was so outrageous. Even Wolf Blitzer did the whole exactly. wrap it up, bro, Oscar play out. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah. And look down in shame and disgust. Wolf Blitzer. I still can't get it. I mean, again, it, it really, it's been amazing just to look at my own media consumption, uh, Drew, and, and to, you know, contemplate about the people that I used to listen to. Uh, you know, I mean, going back years ago when I first used to watch Jimmy Dore with Chank Huger and Anna Kasparian on the Young Turks program or Tim Black, what up, Johnson, or... David Dole or Jamal Thomas or Mike Figueredo. And, you know, one by one by one, these people have just completely gone banana lost it. Same with Amy Goodman and Democracy Now. It's just been so disappointing to see people literally uh, like a snake molting in old skin. And now you got fresh lizard skin to behold. You know, I mean, it's, it's like because it's so lizard brain when you get these visceral responses that are just so soulless and inhumane uh, regardless you know and i'm not even just speaking to the to the issue of of gaza but but the inability to see other people and nations and humans as equals but rather to always see everything through this exceptional prism um, and it's 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 really pronounced inside the United States when it comes to this whole attitude and viewpoint of constant exceptionalism. Uh, and so I see a lot of that, a lot of those traits in, in Zionism. Uh, well, when how you, when exceptionally you... good their military is and how exceptionally good they is this, that. And of course, it's just propaganda. Well, well, the problem is I find that when your only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm-hmm. And it's shown in the way in which they've they've approached Gaza. They've been bombing it flat out for, what, over three weeks now? If they really were about rooting out Hamas and getting rid of it as they say they want to, they want to extinguish Hamas from the face of the earth, and they claim that they care about civilian losses, if they were really true to their word and had some courage, they'd have real boots on the ground kicking in doors and looking for people. Instead, they are bombing all the time, killing their own hostages at the same time. Hannibal. They're not, they're not willing to go down the route of what the US did in Iraq. Iraq was a schmozzle in itself, but at least Americans were actively going door to door and arguably putting themselves in harm's way. Yes, that occurred. But Israel just isn't prepared to do that. I think they're waiting on the international community to do it for them, especially if Iran and Syria and Lebanon get drawn into this conflict, they'll be the first to put their hands up for support. But you know, they, they intensified the siege. They said no more food, no more water, no more electricity, no more fuel will be allowed in, period. War These crimes, are all yeah. human animals. And then you look at the actual documents that have been approved by the Israeli Knesset where they their open stated policy is to ethnically cleanse all of the Gaza Strip to make it completely unlivable for any human. And so their bombing campaign has focused on destroying the wastewater sewage plants 
happen. They've done that. They've destroyed the last of the water treatment plants. And then they moved on to targeting um, refugee camps, schools, and hospitals, one by one by one by one. And at this point, I think about four or five dozen UN personnel have been killed in Gaza. And and of course, the, the most outrageous thing to me has got to be where they will airdrop, I say the IDF and allies, will airdrop leaflets and, and broadcast through speakers, instructing them to all go here and to all take this road to go there. And as soon as they all assemble at the at the given place and given time, they're then bombed. You know, they 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 told the uh, uh, the hospital next to uh, Al Quds because Al Quds was already leveled, and they told the hospital next to it that they uh, needed to evacuate all their patients and get out. That hospital is going to be bombed in an hour. And then they bombed all the as soon as all the host, all the ambulances were lined up with all the patients ready to do the patient move, and they're all in the ambulances. They then bombed the ambulances. Well, you know, it comes and back to the doing comparison with Vietnam strikes nonstop and double tap strikes. I don't really think were even known by the general public until the Australian journalist Julian Assange released the video that's known as collateral murder showing a classic American double tap strike in Baghdad, where they first target Reuters journalists with a, with a cameraman and, and a, a, an anchorman. And then they hover in, in the Black Hawk attack helicopter and they hover over the site and they wait for the first responders mm-hmm. to arrive on scene, you know, the paramedics and the ambulance. And they show up and they grab the Reuters journalist and they put them on the gurney and walk over and load them into the back of the ambulance. And as soon as they're loaded into the ambulance, double they tap. then double tap and yep. uh, strike the ambulance. And we've got to make sure that, that in Gaza, well, particularly during this uh, campaign over the last three weeks. And so when you look at their actual documents, uh, you know, in Hebrew, uh, and you can get them translated easily. The, 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 these are open stated policy objectives. I mean, the, their plan was to ethnically cleanse Gaza and send them all to the Sinai, and so that they can then eventually then reoccupy the Sinai because now they're a problem in the Sinai. I mean, you you can see it coming from a mile well, away. And here's the problem: is how it links back to the idea of it being very reminiscent of Vietnam. Vietnam was as much about the drug trade and the rubber trade as it was anything else. Like the French were in there for the rubber trade for the most part. We look at what's happening with Gaza now. Gaza stands in the way of one of the most prosperous oil fields off the coast of Israel that the world's ever seen. And it's wanting to build its own version of the Chinese Silk Road from that coast down through along in all the way to India, making their own trade route, their own economic Silk Road. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's in the way is Gaza and the Palestinian people in that area of the world. So it's as much a a theological and religious and cultural type of a conflict as it is about economics and the bottom line of the dollar. And again, oil pops up with this. It's always about the money. It's about making money off off the weapons manufacturers. It's big banks that make money off conflicts and the small little guy that's caught out in the middle of it, both Israeli citizens and Palestinians. So they're the people that- I'm glad you brought that up. That is a major component of what's going on here. And I've really not heard anyone talk about that. And that is the petrochemical exploitation and exploration that's ongoing on that Eastern shore of the the Mediterranean Sea. Um, And for example, uh, the single largest floating natural gas plant uh, that I know of on water, uh, Israel brought in and parked uh, several nautical miles within Lebanese waters. Uh, and it's been operational, I want to say, for about a year and a half now, going back to early 2022. A- anyways, um, the Israelis have this natural gas platform that's sucking out um, carbons there in Lebanese waters off Lebanon, where they have a territorial overlap claim against Lebanon, because, <laughs> spoiler alert, <laughs> thanks to the Greater Zion Project, that Israel eventually would love to claim all of Lebanon 
and Syria and the Sinai again and everything else. And I mean, you know, that they've been shelling and continue to shell Syria and uh, Lebanon. Um, we were talking about that the other night on Get Back Carter. Uh, Last Russell, night. This, the, this is that's the, the this Trump is... Heights. Used to be called the Golan. It's now Trump Heights. Hmm. Well, this is the the historical issue with what's going on. Lebanon used to be referred to the Paris of the Middle East. It was a beautiful place to visit. Westerners would always holiday there. After the Civil War, that changed. And a lot of people don't know the Lebanese Civil War is a direct result of Palestinians being kicked out of that area of the world. And they left, went into Lebanon as refugees, and then started an insurgency. That's what the Civil War was predominantly over. It was Palestinians versus Lebanese. The world doesn't talk about that. And that only occurred as a direct result of being people being kicked off their land. So it's it's a multi-generational, multi-decade plan going on here. You destabilize a prosperous Middle Eastern country that has a great amount of support economically and culturally from the rest of the Western world. You destabilize it, make it a third world nation so it's easy to conquer in the coming decades. And of course, you know, historically speaking, Lebanon is literally ground fucking zero for repeated European crusade after crusade after crusade after crusade. The best preserved stone castles that were literally built by hand. Uh, stones carved by hand by the crusaders themselves, like the Chateau du Coq outside of uh, Medina Beirut. Uh, you know, I... It's a, in that it looks like literally the day it was conquered by the Turks. Um, and so in that context, um, you know, they have dealt with this uh, constant waves of crusades. And, and what characterizes the mark of the crusades to me is not the prevalence of the English language, but it's the parts of the Arab world. Uh, où les gens parlent français, and and of course we're talking about Beirut and Damascus, or I'm sorry, Damascus. Um, you know, because uh, you know Syria and Lebanon uh, were uh, French colonies for a long time, and and to this day, uh, a lot of the Arabs there still speak French. I mean, look at Richie Medhurst, who's a Syrian, uh, and you know he speaks fluent French as well as Arabic as well as English. Uh, anyway. Yeah, there's a lot going on in that and part you know, of the, the world. The the Palestinian diaspora, where it made those problems for Lebanon with the civil war uh, and the fighting. And of course, you had those uh, Sabra and Shatila massacres too, where the you know don't forget about the Mossad and the IDF and all the fuck shit they've been doing in Lebanon and their involvement, intense involvement in the Lebanese civil war. Um, but you know the influx of Palestinian immigrants into Turkey mm -hmm. has had major political implications in Turkey uh, and in Ankara and the government, um, you know, uh, and of course you've got the issues of uh, Palestinian immigrants that have poured into Germany. I don't know how many Americans are aware of just the, uh, the ungodly amount of, I wasn't uh, aware of it. Arab immigrants that have just poured into Germany. Um, there's a, and, and a lot of Southeast Asians too. I How mean, are they it, getting to Germany? Uh, they literally get they're in the Mediterranean. They'll jump on boats. So they'll start at the Middle East. They'll get on boats or North Africa, depending on what nations they're coming from. And then they cross they, to Sicily. They, and they get dinghy. on boats. Get going, little dinghies, little tiny boats. They cross the Mediterranean. <coughs> they get off at either Italy or some other port close nearby, and mm -hmm. they literally walk. They walk the entire way. There's like you see the caravans coming up from South America going towards the United States. There are caravans of young, fighting age Middle Eastern men walking into Europe, and we saw this early in the twenty in the twenty tens where refugees mm -hmm. are welcome in Europe, and Angela Merkel let so many in. And all of them that walked in were young, fighting age men. You didn't see the women. You didn't see the children. Yeah. They just walked in. And the countries let them in because they were refugees from war-torn countries. And the West felt like they need to reciprocate to these people who have been put through turmoil because of the West's involvement. But the ironic thing is, 
At the same time, you had Merkel and Germany and others uh, in the EU allowing free passage through from, you know, Isola di Lampedusa and Sicily there where they're coming across from Libya uh, and then, you know, making their merry way across Sicily and up through Naples and Italy all the way into uh, the body of Europe. Uh, and at the same time, they're allowed passage. The Arab uh, uh, caravans, then you have these North Africans and Central Africans you know, from Niger and Gabon and, you know, like the countries that told France recently to just go fuck itself. Um, and when they show up to like um, Soita and Melilla in Morocco, because for those that aren't aware, um, Spain actually owns two cities in Morocco on the African coast. And the only thing preventing Africans from legally stepping foot in Europe, the parts of Europe that are in Africa, make it make sense. Um, and they have huge fences. And so there's an infamous video where an entire group of black migrants at the Malia, Spain border fence uh, were all literally clubbed to death like a pack of fucking leopard seals. Um and so, and that happened at the same time. You've got yeah, this. Uh, um, and this Syrian, is the idea of Gaddafi. Uh, it right? was a, mainly a Syrian diaspora, but also from Libya. I mean, yeah, same like time. It, we've seen the same thing here in the U.S. Yeah, well, Some well, are welcomed whole, well, in, others are turned away. Well, the whole idea was Gaddafi, love him, hate him, or just listen to his policies. Very racist man towards um, sub-Saharan Africans. He openly said if... I, if my government and my country does not exist, blacks will flood Europe. And now that he's been taken out, you are seeing the biggest mass migration of North Africans into Europe that history has seen since the, the Moors invaded Spain. Mm -hmm. There's so and they're all many pouring through Libya. In. They are, yep. Right through uh, Tarabalus and uh, Benghazi, or I'm um, Tripoli. I'm Sometimes I wonder what word to use when I'm naming these places because it's what, you know, you got the the name that people call themselves, but then mm -hmm. you've got the name that other people call them. You know, like, what is it? Um, Bhutar versus India, right? Uh, I thought it was Burat or something. Yeah, Burat. Burat. Yeah. yeah. Not to be confused with Borat, who is from Zakazakhstan. Very nice. Very, very nice. High five. <laughs> So, so what about the Southern American border? We hear things sporadically over here. Mm -hmm. The the influx oh. that you're getting of people from the Southern border just is, seems astronomical to me. And as, especially as an Australian, because we don't share any common land borders with any nation. We've got the benefit of being surrounded by water. We That's can turn true. boats around. You guys just get them walk over willy-nilly, which seems like a far, it's completely foreign concept to me and such a bizarre thing. Oh, it's more bizarre than that. We've gone from pictures it's of pretty awesome. rangers and border patrols on horseback, apparently horse whipping migrants coming across the border to what I saw yesterday. Oh, no. Where CBP is out there with a front end loader lifting up the barbed wire to help them get across. <clears throat> and it's all coordinated because Man. they're crossing at a place where migrants don't normally cross. There's a group of almost 1,200. And all the support staff and CBP and everybody's there with blankets and coolers and water and everything right at that one spot and all lined up 30 minutes right before they show up. You know, it's really funny. That same image is being used as evidence of Hamas getting into Israel. Right. <laughs> They're using the image of Southern people getting into the American border with the excavator, <sighs> saying that's how Hamas breached the border. I'm like, it's the wrong country, the wrong yeah. people. You just can't pick brown people and say it's them. That's incredibly racist. Well, what was really bizarre to me is when I heard this alleged uh, IDF recording that they captured of two Hamas fighters who were admitting over the radio that they had accidentally bombed their own hospital, El Ahli Hospital, the one that 
the IDF had warned an hour before they were going to bomb it, that they were going to bomb it and they all needed to evacuate. But then somehow, before they then bombed it an hour later, Hamas accidentally bombed it first. But anyway, so the IDF produces this recording, allegedly, of the two Hamas fighters in Gaza saying, oh shit, we just bombed our own hospital. And they're like, see, do you see the terrorist admits what they do? And I'm listening to the Arabic that these guys are speaking, and they can't even pronounce the fucking huh. I'm like, they're, they can't even speak the language. Like, they're clearly the dot, the dot not like even native that. Arab speakers, and they're novices in vocabulary, and it's they're not even speaking a Gazan accent. It's like a fucking Egyptian. Somebody's learning bits and pieces of Egyptian Arabic, which is very different from regular. I mean, I was an Arabic linguist in the U.S. Army in Desert Storm. I mean, I, you know, I, I can understand the Arabic pretty good. Would, and, would you equate it to Yon that it's the you know that it's the equivalency of the Australian accent English versus the American accent that someone from one part of the Middle Eastern world speaking with their dialect, you can pick the difference between theirs and the Gazans. Is that the type of reference? You're yes, making? but but it's even so much more pronounced. Because it's like the difference between some bloody bogan in Australia trying to understand someone from Cardiff in Wales that's mm. only speaking fucking Welsh. And Damn. you're like, it's if only Johnny Vedmore was here like right English, now. But it's not. Mm. It's the only Welsh Welshman I know. It's a strange language. It's, it's a form of Gaelic. Gaelic. Yeah, yeah. Gaelic 0 2030. So what happens to America then? Drizzle, I'd like to get your take on this. What uh, happens don't to America? Don't ask me, if, man. Ask you, uh, oh, come on. Ask gotta, Hezbollah. Come on, I didn't pick your brain. Hezbollah is the one <laughs> that has given us the uh the death sentence or whatever. So whatever they have in store for America, I'm sure is coming in short order. Okay, Ando, you're going to have to answer this one for me then. Give yeah. me your hot take. What happens to America if unmitigated migration comes from the southern border? Is it just going to be northern Mexico again, like the states used to be prior to going out west? Do you think those states will ever actually return to being completely Latin-based areas or what? What's going to happen long term? Long term? Yeah, I think so. I, I think culturally the, the culture is, is if, if we don't take it back, it's just going to get completely eroded. Um, and, and it, it's even happening. So the big target in these things was the, uh, Midwest and you can see cities like, uh, you can see cities like Dearborn that just has this increasing immigrant community that, that has, I mean, they, they have representation in Congress. That's how crazy it is. And these are Midwestern towns that were majority white for ages. And then they are you talking about Dearborn, living. Michigan. Yeah. Oh, little Saudi Arabia. Exactly. Hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so this is no accident. And uh, funny enough, those people that we keep talking about have a lot to do with this. They're the ones that, that fund the NGOs that get all of, uh, all of these cultures here. And, I don't know if there's a lot to the the these guys are fighting age men, but I've uh, you've heard the story. I'm sure other people have heard it that uh, some guy in London that uh, runs a bed and breakfast, um, the government gave him a whole bunch of money to house these migrants, and then they started giving them shipments of weapons. Um, I I don't know how true that is, um, but it it does kind of i mean it kind of plays into a little bit of a red dawn fantasy but i can't see it working so well in the united states because most of us are armed to the teeth uh and if you don't have one you know where to get one pretty quick um i i'm not sure but i i i think that the way that they're doing it you know poisoning our food feeding us television and uh and all the rest of the garbage that has been destroying america uh is is how they could continue to do it because they they played that as a long game and mm -hmm. it's worked out really really well um and and it's completely dissolving our culture so to your points what i'm noticing is it's not all images and not all men in these photos 
but there's a sizable percentage of these young men both going into Europe and the United States that when they're standing, they're at parade rest. You can very easily tell that their their body language, the way they carry themselves, they are militarily trained men. And that could arguably be they were serving in, say, a Republican guard or something and they decided to flee their country. Okay, I'll take that. But for so many of them to be at parade rest, that gives me concern. And like right. you said, Andrew, it may not be this generation, but what happens after two, three more generations where the native population of Americans aren't having as many kids, they're deciding to watch uh, anime and Transformers and go to the movies and get their takeaway, not have kids, YOLO life. What happens when that generation starts to age out and the new arrivals have had five or six kids and then the uh, demographic uh, uh. changes? And and mm-hmm. that, folks, is how Yonalings take over the world. I've had <laughs> eight little Yonalings on this world so far. And oh, again, congratulations. Tynism. I'm coming for you, Copenhagen. <laughs> Watch yourself, was, you Danes. I was listening to the new music potluck this morning, and I, nice. I heard you got a new little one into this world. So uh, congratulations, Actually, twins. Jonah. Two of them. Two yep. for oh. one. Yeah. Two for the price of one. Or two for the price of two. <laughs> but yeah, congratulations. So we know that the, at least the next generation will have its Yonas. They will be out there in the world, spreading seed and uh, doing what Yonas are supposed to do. That's right. Spreading truth and, and persevering. You know, it's, it's ironic looking at the migration patterns and the location of the southern boundary of the uh, genocidal settler colonialism project that I lovingly call America. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, Drew did point out that there's been several, what's a good euphemism, annexations of Mexican territory by the Americans, where they've just, um, well, they didn't steal it, they just annexed it without asking. They just took it. Same with German and Russian territories within the continental United States as well. Yeah. Uh, and so, long story short, um, if I look, if I go back on the history of our Cherokee tribe, we were originally down in Mexico with the Natchez and the Seminole and the Choctaw and the Chickasaw, and numerous Native tribes have, over the last three to four millennia, or three to four thousand years, we've moved around back and forth between uh you know south of the chihuahuan desert and up above the great plains and over by the great lakes and uh you know we've been able to move around um uh and you know ultimately it was the rise of the toltec and olmec and then the aztec empires that led our tribe and many others to just get the fuck out of there because we really we really did not enjoy having open heart surgery performed on us at the top of the pyramid. Um, and they love doing that. Uh, and so... Yeah, blood sacrifice is only fun if you're the guy doing it to other people. Right. The receiving end isn't so good. Salient point. Um, and so it's interesting that you know most of the what are called Mexicans or Spanish that are coming across the border into the United States proper are in fact my direct blood relatives and they belong to one of the 385 different recognized first nation tribes that make up mexico so you literally got native americans that speak spanish coming across the border well uh, i thought we had a bunch of venezuelans coming across the border uh I thought it was Venezuelans that were coming in. Or is that just New York State that has the Venezuelan immigrant community? There's a lot of Venezuelans in New York and Ecuadorian. For some reason, Brooklyn is like the next best thing to Hugo de Coco. They are all there. Like there's a a town in Queens called Corona. (laughs) And it's literally got... It's the fourth largest city of Ecuador, but it's in the United States. You know when you Americans should really worry? 
is when the southern border starts getting overtaken by penguins because then they've gone as far south as they possibly can. If you got penguins coming up from Antarctica, watch out. They're looking for your jobs. Drew knows about the penguins. This this bloke's bloody smart. Yeah. I've been warning people about the penguins for a while. I did not I did not talk to Drew before this. We're not exchanging notes. We're not chatting. He it, he already knows about the penguins. Holy shit. Those damn black white nationalists. Well, you know, they're imperial because they're emperor penguins. It's in the name. It's in the name. Our only hope is to ally with leopard it. seals. <laughs> You know, Drew, you're kind of close by. Have you ever tried to go to Antarctica? I haven't. Uh, the closest I could get would be to go to Tasmania and then go south as far as I can until the military and the Navy turn me around because that's generally what happens. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Wasn't Tasmania where they built the first tram railroad with the prison labor and stuff? That was like... Uh... After Captain Cook landed and everything, I was thinking that Tasmania was like the first major prison colony. Yeah, Tasmania was the major prison colony in, in Australia just because it's an island in itself. Yeah. So Hobart, Port Arthur, they were yeah. all used, built by, by um, colonial and a lot of uh, slave labor of a lot yeah, of Irish. Good, good. In- prison slave labor built yeah. the first yeah. tram railway in Australia from... Uh, Port Arthur to Hobart. Uh, Hobart. 1830 something. Ancient history. Wow. I'm such a trade nerd. I'm so. It's all right. I love you're, my you're buddy. You're in the right place. And, uh, and we appreciate buff. it. <laughs> we do. We appreciate it. I don't know. They've been, they've been beating this israel palestine thing so hard for three weeks now four weeks now holy cow it's been four weeks now we're four weeks through the six-week cycle i don't did i say that out loud i'm looking forward to the next current thing which is a hot world war three it's time to turn up the oven do you think they're going to do that before christmas you think they're going to take Christmas away from the people? They didn't do it during COVID. They didn't take At away least Christmas. Let me get a good Christmas dinner in beforehand. Like, let me have a Christmas dinner, potatoes, gravy, turkey, the whole, whole spread. Let me have that at least. Mm-hmm. Well, I am glad that we are ignoring Thanksgiving because you really shouldn't expect a turkey this Dude, year. Dude, we are. We are ignoring Thanksgiving. Ongoing. Look. We had There's to a go, turkey flu going around again. <clears throat> dude, we had to go to the store earlier to get stuff, right? Food and whatnot. Uh, there was already, there's a, like a park, right? Like a, a municipally maintained park in the middle of Jasper, right? Jasper's very small, like maybe 5,000 people, maybe 10,000 if we're pushing it, right? Very, very small. The park, it is November the 3rd today, as I'm speaking. The park are, is already decorated for Christmas. They got the laurels and the wreaths going around, everything. It's all uh, green and red and ready for Christmas, and it's November 3rd. What happened to Thanksgiving? Yeah, it's gone. Listen, as, Done. A, Cherokee, Over. Done as a Cherokee in America, man. Thanksgiving is the only holiday where we get everyone else to dress up like Indians and appropriate our culture. And I love that shit. Jesus, even Australians are doing some form of of your holiday. Norfolk Island, which is a, an Australian quasi-territory after the, the bounty the, and the... Uh, the, the prisoners revolting and creating their own little nation state. They had so many American whalers visit that island. They now have Thanksgiving as a holiday on their little part of Australia. So if you guys have just jumped ahead to Christmas and we're doing it, the world's all topsy-turvy. Well, it's being done on purpose, um, or at least that's one way that you can look at it. Because again, Thanksgiving is a uniquely American holiday. 
for you know the version of history that we are told it didn't exist before uh you know the 1600s and what we now call the northeast so it's, it's true if you go back in the cherokee record it was fuck all before then yeah so but again it's part of the demoralization right take away everything that is uniquely American from the culture, and then you'll be able to replace it with whatever you want. Man, I got to give a shout out to the HMS Bounty for keeping it Thanksgiving. Great mutiny, boys. And it was yeah. worth it. Have you ever gotten some Polynesian ass? Get you some of that. <laughs> you'll be well, mutinying too. It baffles me that why the rest of us didn't do that. Like, they had the balls to do it there. Why didn't the rest of us do it against the British that were here? Then we could have been America 2.0. Mm -hmm. But instead, we are the uh, the byproduct of American Revolution uh, Independence War, where you guys said no more to the British, and then the British had to send their convicts somewhere else, so they chose here. We only exist because you guys said no. Now, a lot of people don't know that Savannah... And the uh, colony of James Oglethorpe that became the state of Georgia was originally the British penal colony for the British Empire. And uh, most of the Georgians uh, that were initially settled uh, were all some of the absolute worst criminals from England. Um, and then when the Cherokee accidentally discovered gold in Georgia and our newly arrived a British criminal found out, well, that's what led to the Trail of Tears because, you know, a gold rush has a way of, you know, changing the dynamic on the ground, uh, to say the least, mm -hmm. when people show up with pickaxes and shovels. Anyway. There's gold! There's gold in the Mare Hills! Mm -hmm. That makes sense, though. I've been to Atlanta. I know what those people are like. Yeah. I just went through Atlanta and Man, the traffic in Atlanta is the absolute worst if you're a truck driver. I'm going to take some heat for this, but I just have to say it, you know. I, I don't find it very to... sophisticated when Atlanta literally uses the name of Peachtree for 58 different fucking streets. Literally, you can't find any other fucking name to use for your street. I, yeah, Just tell somebody, meet yeah. me in Atlanta on Peachtree. Mm-hmm. Down in Buckhead. So they, bu they what, busted out the cinnamon, synonyms book, did they? And just went through every variation they could find? Yeah. I thought we had to call it Hotlanta, like after that bullshit fucking CBS show, whatever it was. It's Hotlanta. Come on, people. Uh, yeah. Okay, whatever. Like it is I'm, climate I'm bringing change. back Hotlanta. I also, I'm also bringing back my fanny pack. And I'm glad to know. Yeah. I knew, I knew it when, when Richard was talking on the main show about the mom jeans coming back. Mm -hmm. I knew if we get mom jeans back, fanny pack is going to make you come back. At last, I can have that man purse out front to hide the pooch. No, <laughs> man, no, you gotta, you gotta exercise. That's how you get rid of the pooch. You exercise and you cut out the processed sugars. Yona, uh, the fanny pack is already back. If you're uh, if if you're a shotgun guy, you can just jam around, have a fanny pack full of shotgun shells. It's almost like you're jamming. You're good. We we call them bum bags. They're really good for ADC stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. knife in there, everything works. You know, we should start a charity. Uh, fanny packs. For um, fighting age males, and and we can distribute them at the southern border. <laughs> we can give them a, a telephone and a card with five thousand dollars on it. Yeah, and, we can get you know, a UN sponsorship. Uh -oh. Yeah, and it'll all be zipped inside the fanny pack, ready to strap on. Yeah, they've done this kind of thing. Click it before. in place. They know what ready they're to doing. Go. Welcome to America, boys. They can be baby blue as well, and they can have the letters UN on them. Yes. Not to be dis to, to be mistaken with the UN, just the letters U and then N. So didn't they give the people in Lahaina just seven hundred bucks or something like that? Yeah. yeah. They're, they're they're giving all these. Uh, they the gave migrants. households seven hundred bucks. Yeah. yeah. Not yeah. people. Households. Just, yeah. Yeah. 
just to let everybody out there know, I, I do the little fingery thing whenever I'm saying migrants because they're they're invaders. They're not migrants. It's not like there's a migration going on. They're coming in without permission and you know, they're being welcomed in. To be fair, they, they did deliberately break the immigration system on purpose because undocumented workers are the absolute lowest member of the lowest caste in America because undocumented workers are the easiest to manipulate and get rid of, as I've seen countless times where they drive gooseneck trailer trucks down to Brownsville, load them full of Tyson chicken plant workers and haul their ass back up to Morristown, Tennessee. And as soon as one of them bitches, well, an anonymous complaint is made to the immigration. Immigration shows up, arrests those, takes them out, and they send the gooseneck back down to Texas again to get more workers. So, you know, I mean, it's it's hard to paint the migrants coming in uh, with, with a, a broad brush to say they're all doing this and they're all doing that. But I know that particularly there are a lot of migrants that, work here and send money back to Latin America, be it Mexico, El Salvador, Nicaragua, wherever, uh, with the intention of going back home. And they used to be able to work in the United States under the California Bracero program, for example, where they were seasonal workers. They would be given documentation. They would come in during the harvest pick the apples and the oranges or what the fuck ever. And then when they're done, they've made their money and they go back home to their farm. And, and that worked for years. So they got rid of it. And all the different migrant worker problems, they got rid of it. Fuck it. And so we still use the migrant labor as we always have. It's just that now they don't have any rights at all. And then on top of that. There's cheap labor got, now. On top of that, and I'm just talking mainly about the Latin American migrants and workers. On top of that, because of the poorest nature of the southern border now, we're seeing all kinds of migrants coming in from the stands. Yes, Borat, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Mongolia. You would be a North African, country, you know, uh, Morocco, uh, Saharawis coming in. Again, literally people coming in through the southern border from every part of the world and this flood yep. of migrants that's coming in now with these caravans of hundreds, most of them are Southeast Asian. There's been a bunch hmm. of these, um, what's it called there, that's been picked on in Burma and everything, Rohingya or Rohingya or Rohingya or something. But Rohingya. anyways... Uh, Rohypnol. <laughs> That's it. Rohypnol. Yeah, um, date rape uh, Asians. <laughs> yeah. And so, so you know, I, it's it it's staggering how many are pouring in through the southern border, and then on top of that, you got all kinds of migrants that are going straight to Canada, and they're just walking right into the United States from Canada. The so, longest land border on earth between two yep. countries is the United States and Canada. Vast majority We're of the boundary one. between the United States and Canada We're isn't even one. You just walk right across. Uh, yeah. America. And it makes a lot of sense too because uh because there's also that border that's Alaska and Canada it makes it almost double what it is mm -hmm. on the uh just across east to west. That's but right. uh I've taken the uh, the Greyhound from Laredo hundreds of times, and uh, most of the time, I'm the only person that 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 speaks only English on the the bus. Um, there's uh, it, it's um, it's almost entirely been Hispanic for most of the time, but there's That's been Laredo. a few instances where yeah, uh, well Laredo the the border is pretty sanitary in, in Laredo. Laredo is is I I would say one of the most important cities in the United States because of because of the trucking there. Um, that's 
where most of your crap comes in. That's where the load I'm delivering right now, it came from Laredo. Um, a lot of stuff comes out, a lot of stuff goes in. It's, um, it, it's really important. But all of the problems that, that we saw were um, the stuff that you saw on TV, the scene where the guy was whipping the guy. Apparently that guy was beating up his, uh, his significant other and the cop just had to whip him um, with the, the reins. Um, anyway, that those scenes took place down in Eagle Pass, uh, which is right uh, right up the border from Laredo. Um, so in other words, awesome... Zetas and not Cartel del Golfo, just to be specific. Have you right. seen the? Yeah. Have you seen the YouTube clip where it, it's that scene? It's got the the news presenter. Now these these uh, images might be distressing to some viewers of a U.S. marshal, whatever they say, whipping a migrant, and then it cuts to scenes from the old seventies Planet of the Apes where the horse they're riding down after the humans, and there's apes on the horses. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't perfect. See that. It's perfect yeah. me. I love it. Yeah, that was the horse uh, play that I was talking about earlier. <laughs> So there's a military base the, uh, there by uh, Del Rio, and Del Rio is another hole. So, uh, so I know that Eagle Pass is one of the places they're letting them in, um, and then the other place is uh, is Del Rio, um, and there's a military base over there, and that's where apparently they were doing the the flights. They were flying them to other parts of the country mm-hmm. from that that military base there in Del Rio. And, and, you know, there's been a tremendous amount of these immigrants that are being placed here in West Virginia. I mean, I, I've had countless run-ins at the gas pumps gassing up my van and hearing what I thought was Russian and then being corrected when I speak Polruski to them that we are Ukrainsky. And then I look yeah. and I'm like, oh shit, fucking Nazi tattoos. Oh my God. Oh my God. Is that a fucking Hitler on your bicep? I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> like literally every single Ukrainian I've met has got fucking na- Nazi tats. Um, Cause I mean, I guess those are the really good ones that we're protecting and bringing to America. I guess. Maybe it's just the custom in their country. It's a different you know? culture. Young men you. turn a certain age, their fathers or, you know, whatever, take oh, them down oh. to the tattoo studio. You can't be too sensitive about tattoos and everything. You know, I mean, if you don't like the way it looks, just laugh that ass off. There you go. And it's, all right. it's definitely cultural because of the grandsons of SS soldiers. It's just family tradition. That's all. Yeah. You know, that's something even a Canadian can respect. Let's go off an SF. That's what a lot of Canadian politicians respect, apparently. All of them yeah. standing ovations <laughs> twice. Shout out Yaroslav Hunka and the Yaroslav Hunka Endowment for Ukrainian Studies at the University of Alberta. Uh, apply now at the uh, Office of Admission. Well, gentlemen, we've got about 10 minutes to the top of the 12 o'clock hour on the east coast of the United States. Uh, what do you want to touch on that we haven't already fingered a little bit tonight? Um, I just wanted I, to put I, a, a point out. I'm sorry. I, I mentioned Alberta. Alberta is a province of the Confederation of Canada, for those that are wondering what in the fuck in Alberta is. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. I know what Alberta is. I've, I've been there. I started a bike tour from Alberta and went through Banff and it was gorgeous. Um, but uh, I I had a phone call in the middle of this. You probably saw me talking, but not actually talking on the show. Um, but I was going to answer Drew's question and we've tweeted back and forth about it before was that I I think that because the entire world economy is tied into America somehow. And I know that Australia is mostly tied into China, but China is super tied into America. And um, the thing is, it's the powder keg. It's, it's all fused together. And they, if they need to collapse the economy quick and get us onto CBDCs or whatever the hell that they're, they're planning to get us on um, and, you know, or just cause the discord and disruption that, that, 
they need to uh, to do their next thing, then pulling the string of the United States is an important key. And because it, America is not immune because the entire world's economy counts on America, America is more susceptible because the entire world's economy counts on America. So that's that's what I'm thinking at this point. Because I mean, this is it's it's a controlled demolition, as we've probably been saying for several years now. That octopus of global control, the tentacles run deep into every facet of the world, into every economy. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think every they. Time I think of that octopus, I see Cecil Rhodes' face. I'm oh, sorry. good lord, stop that. Yeah, I don't think they necessarily need to, like, completely destroy America, right? They just need to get it to the point, and Canada, too, because it's not just America that this is all happening to. Canada has their role in it as well. You know, Mexico is rising right now as far as an economic power. It might not look like it, but they are. America's well, strength Mexico. is waning. Canada is eating itself. I mean, there's no other nice way to put it. Eventually, they'll get to a point of equilibrium where you can then take those three separate nations and kind of fold them into you know, a cross-border kind of partnership type of union. The North American bloc? Yeah. Something like that. Something like that. Now, it, L- like a NAFTA right, man bear pig. Yeah. <laughs> a NAFTA man bear pig. Drizzle, you're, you're spot on the idea it doesn't necessarily have to fail. We're so fat lazy now as Westerners, all we need to do is feel a little bit uncomfortable. Could you imagine if we went through Depression era style economies? Like America didn't collapse. The West didn't collapse during the Depression. Times just got hard. If we had even half of that as a culture today, I could see a lot of people throwing all their rights away just to have a a monthly paycheck from the government. And they will. Watch. Yeah. Yep. Um, g- give me the jab so I can get my UBI. I'm trying to get this new video game downloaded on my cell phone. Help me out, bro. I'm trying to play Candy Crush over here, and I need the extra points. Come on. And yeah, you're not going to get it unless you work on your social credit score, buddy. Get that social credit score up. I mean, you know, right. Lick that I'm boot. so depressed by the fact that China built all these awesome high-speed rail lines all over China. And, and connecting into Tibet, and now they're going into Nepal, and, you know, eventually into, you know, they've got all these trains, and then they've got their old shitty green trains on the old national network. And then they got the shitty fucking buses, right? Or, I'm sorry, shitty buses, shitty train, shitty walk. Um, and, of course, when you go Welcome get a ticket... Walk. Take your order pre... <laughs> <laughs> You gotta get your ticket from the kiosk. (laughs) And like, the first thing it does at the kiosk, of course, it has to do the facial scan, right? Uh, And then it identifies you with your biometric data, and then it shows your social credit score. And if your social credit score ain't high enough, well, you might not get to take the high speed train. You might only be able to get a ticket for the slow green train. But if you've got a social credit score like the Yona, which reads out, kill him now, um, you don't even get to take the bus unless you go across the street and give plasma real quick. So I'll be right back. Well, Yona, this is what's catching a lot of Westerners out at the moment. The social credit system has been in place for a while in China, but Westerners really don't understand it. So many tourists to China go over, take out huge amounts of cash in Chinese dollars or yen or whatever the fuck they use. They get there and they can't actively use money anywhere. It's all via bank card. And the process of getting approved to use your bank card in China is near impossible for the CCP to approve a foreigner. So unless you actively know someone in China where you can borrow their card and you can reimburse them later, it's near impossible to spend money there. That's unreal. So this is also why people need to stay away from smart cities. 
because that that's where the control will be the most unless you are the people that want to just play video games and and continue to enjoy your air conditioning you will be completely reliant and you will be injected with whatever they decide they want to inject you with so get as out long of as market. i get my three square meals of gruel a day my allocation of water and non-stop access to porn i'll be that's happy. right there's Porn the hub Zuma. has got to be. Come on, Guang Lee. Let me borrow that card one more time. I'll suck your dick. I got to get this shit off Alibaba. <laughs> Bro. Yeah, it probably will turn everybody into uh, sex workers in a weird way. That's, yeah. I'm still Gross. waiting okay. for the first clothing company that offers like a monthly or yearly subscription, right? And then like you're... Your monthly allotment of clothing will get delivered from Amazon by drone. Don't laugh. The UN are talking about that. They're saying oh, I know the they are. Way to combat climate change oh, is just, to have one set of wait, clothes for the year. Wait till you see what jobs are going to look like in the year 2050. It's going to blow it's gonna your be, fucking mind. It's going to be like the fifth element when Bruce Willis wakes up and his bed goes back into the wall and it comes yeah. out with fresh sheets each day and everything's plastic wrapped. And everyone has like the futuristic clothes, which are all the same. Yes, except imagine to- that happening in Cleveland, and that's what it's going to look like everywhere. And what's wild is on the Fifth Element, when you go to smoke a Fifth Element cigarette, I'm not sorry, Cleveland. It's like the cigarette part is actually the length of the filter, and the filter is actually the length of the cigarette part. And so you wouldn't be lighting it back, you'd be doing it. And you'd burn most of the actual cigarette off when you light it. What a waste. Yeah. Your allocation of nicotine is gone this week. You said no, no word about the government. Which you would have thought in the fifth element future, they wouldn't be smoking cigarettes anymore. They would have moved on to vaping or something. But uh, I guess, you know, if you had high expectations for the future, (laughs) you should lower them now. Anyway. Uh, I'm still hoping for a Mad Max scenario so at least I can come out on top as a warlord, but I don't think it's going to be that good. Uh, well, Drew, uh, is there any special technique you would recommend as an uh, Australian for um, bungee uh, cord chainsawing? You know, two man <laughs> enter, one Yona Lee. That's how it's going to work out. <laughs> Uh, the, the trick is getting them on the ankles first, hit the, uh, the Achilles heel, and then you're fine. You can even drop a Master Blaster doing that. Awesome. I got to take some notes. Hang on. 